Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Napoleon's First Campaign, Episode 5, Rivoli, by Epic History TV. Now, this is the last episode in Epic History series on Napoleon's First Campaign, and I'm very excited to get into it. Last time, we saw Napoleon's bloody victory at Arcalay, both a victory on the field and a big propaganda victory. Napoleon has defeated the Austrians time and time again, and yet they still hold the fortress city of Mantua. And if Napoleon wants to take Italy, he's going to need to take that. I guess we'll see what happens in this episode. Now, if you guys enjoyed this one, I would greatly appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon. It is linked in the description down below, and it will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Also, if you'd like to talk about history, check out the Discord. It's also linked down below. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. An Epic History TV PMF Productions collaboration. Here we go. In 1796, at the height of the French Revolutionary Wars, a young French general took charge of a ragged, demoralized army in northern Italy. Seeing this intro for the last time, I'm so excited to get into it. It was his first command. Many expected him to fail. <laughs> Instead, in just one month, he won his first brilliant campaign. Yeah. With astonishing self-confidence, boldness and energy, he led his army to victory after victory, transforming the war in Europe, winning praise from a grateful republic, and forging a legend. This is the story of Napoleon Bonaparte's first campaign, and the dawn of a new age. All right, here we go, guys. Part five, Rivoli. January 1797. A new year, but familiar problems for 27-year-old General Bonaparte, waging war against the Austrians in northern Italy. Yeah. You know, it's honestly remarkable, as I said in the intro, Napoleon has defeated the Austrians time and time again, and yet when we look at the map, they still hold Mantua. That has been the key to this region. It really is the most important spot. Napoleon needs to take that. So, there's been a lot of movement on this map. But, as they said, Napoleon is faced with a familiar problem. <laughs> he has the great fortress city of Mantua yep. under siege. And after a narrow victory at Arcole, he's once again driven back the Austrian armies, trying to march to its aid. Yes, a bloody and messy victory. And look, some of you thought I was a little too critical of Napoleon last time. Look, I didn't say that his performance was terrible, but as they pointed out, it was a bloody and messy victory. Napoleon still won in the end. It was a decisive victory. Absolutely. I mean, Napoleon... Of course, he's brilliant, and he shows that brilliance in basically every battle he participates in. But it was a bloody and closer battle than he would have liked, I'm sure. But the French army of Italy is in a ragged state. As always. <laughs> Troops have not been paid for weeks. Their uniforms are disintegrating. Their shoes are broken. And above all, they're hungry. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've seen Napoleon has been struggling for supplies this entire campaign. The army of Italy was not doing well when Napoleon was sent to Italy. Now, he managed to whip them into shape, but he has been continually struggling for supplies, arms, uniforms, all those sorts of things. He continually requests them from the French government, and they just do not send the supplies that he needs. And now that he's been marching them around northern Italy... Yeah, of course those issues are going to start to build up unless he gets the things that he needs to supply his damn army. <laughs> One of Napoleon's major concerns is the wretched state of medical care for his mm. men. The hospitals lack everything. Our wounded are lying on the floors and in the most horrible state of destitution. It's not just a question of saving lives and getting wounded men back to their units. Medical care affects morale. Mm. 
as troops going into combat want to know that if the worst happens, they'll be looked after. Yeah, that's actually a really good point that I don't think I've thought of before. You know, we often think of medical care in the context of, all right, these troops need to be brought back to their units so they can fight another day. But that's an excellent point. If you know that there is at least some medical care waiting for you, you know that you'll be taken care of. If you're wounded, you're much more willing to put your life on the line, much more willing to put yourself in harm's way. And as we've seen, Napoleon, though he has his quirks, he is a charismatic leader, right? He was underestimated big time in the beginning, but he's shown his men that he is a man to be followed. You know, he has a good read on his men. And so Napoleon would absolutely have something like that in mind. He wants to take care of them, you know, perhaps to take care of them for the sake of taking care of them, but also to have a well-functioning, effective army with high morale. He knows how important that is. Conditions are much worse for the Austrian garrison of Mantua, oh, yeah. commanded by Field Marshal Wurmser. Well, you know, Wurmser has managed to stuff even more troops into Mantua, and they already didn't have enough food or supplies, so they are really struggling. And you know what? Look, we can look at this map and say, wow, the Austrians continue to hold the city, not much has changed. On one level, that is true, but if we look a little closer, the situation of the Austrian garrison in Mantua has continued to decline as Napoleon has continually fended off attacks from other Austrian armies. So, though Napoleon is sort of always in a bit of a vulnerable, risky position, the position of the Austrians is declining over time. It is changing significantly, even if the map might not show it. In four months of siege, 9,000 soldiers have died Jesus. from disease, wounds, or the effects of malnutrition. And we're talking about, we've seen in this campaign, we look at battles and, you know, we might have a couple thousand casualties from each battle. Three, four, five thousand. The Austrian garrison from its time defending this city, not even fighting. I mean, there's been a couple of sorties out. They've done some fighting, but primarily just from defending the city. We have 9,000 dead, 9,500 sick and wounded. Those are remarkable casualty numbers. Survivors live off horse meat. Ugh. Civilians off rats. Yeah, they're dogs. desperate. They are desperate. Even these miserable rations will run out by the 27th of January. Uh oh. Just a few weeks away. The clock is ticking. The Austrians. Yeah, well, the Austrians have continually tried to relieve the city. And they've failed time and time again. Napoleon has fended them off. If he can just continue to do that, uh, not to say that that's an easy job, absolutely not, but if he can continue to fend them off, eventually the garrison's going to fall or be forced to surrender. Must relieve Mantua by that date. Or lose the city. Right, or instead of this city being relieved by an external Austrian army, I suppose the garrison could attempt to break out. But, I mean, this is such a key position, they want to hold it, and as we've seen, they've tried making sorties out of the city before, and they just haven't found success. Their best chance is external relief, but they are getting very desperate. City. And with it, the war in Italy. Yes. The enemy is withdrawing his troops from the Rhine to send them to Italy. Do the same. Help us. We are only asking for more men. Once again, Napoleon pleads with the Directory. He says, look, the Austrians are committing more and more men to Italy. They see how important it is. Do the same for me. Because so far, Napoleon's basically been left on his own. <laughs> the Directory said, man, you're doing a good enough job on your own. We're going to focus on our other armies operating north along the Rhine. Napoleon saying, hey, and he's been trying to make this point the whole time. This can be an extremely important theater of the conflict. That's been sort of one of his issues from the beginning, is that the Directory sees the fighting along the Rhine as far more important than the fighting in Italy. 
Napoleon is still just asking them for more men, especially if the Austrians are going to be sending more men. Napoleon, having received just 7,000 reinforcements, mm. prepares to meet Alvinci's advance. He will not only be outnumbered, he doesn't know where his enemy will strike. Uh-oh. And Napoleon must hold one division back to cover Wormser's garrison. Yep, that's Napoleon's issue. That's been his issue. Now, as you saw from those numbers, Napoleon isn't greatly outnumbered, but Napoleon has to hold back a significant number of his men in order to defend Mantua. That's been the thorn in his side this entire campaign. You know, I mean, it's a really dangerous spot for him to be in, because if the Austrians can manage an impressive coordinated assault, if they can start pushing him back and Wurmser can break out of the city, then Napoleon is in a lot of trouble. <laughs> he could be surrounded by these Austrian forces. He cannot afford to let that happen. And so he has to hold some of his men back. But of course, that makes him weaker when he faces the armies of, say, Alvinci or some of these other Austrian generals. It's a dangerous position to be in. It's commanded once more by General Serrurier, mm. recovered from his long illness. Augereau's division watches the Adige, while Massena guards Verona. Right. The northern division has a new commander. Napoleon has sacked Vaubois for his poor performance mm. and put in his place General Barthélemy Joubert. Ah. He is a hard-working, brave, an exceptionally modest commander. Schubert. And like Familiar name. He may not make it as far as some of the others, but a prominent name. Napoleon, just 27 years old. General Ray is in reserve south of Lake Garda. General Alvinci has received 14,000 reinforcements and orders to relieve Mantua as soon as possible. <laughs> Yep, that's been the he plan. He's eager to march, <laughs> but heavy snow and the late arrival of equipment and supplies delays his advance until the 7th of January. Mm, not good. He needs to act as quickly as possible. As we saw in Mantua, the garrison, they do not have much longer to go. The first columns on the move are Provera and Berlich, but their offensive is merely a diversion intended to draw Napoleon's attention away from the main threat, Sneaky. which will be coming down the Adige Valley. All right. Alvinci has divided... The newly placed Joubert has a lot to deal with, huh? <laughs> ...this force into six columns. Their mission is to envelop and destroy Joubert's division at Rivoli and clear the path to Mantua. Mm. But Rivoli is a strong defensive position. They must hit it hard and fast before the French can respond. You know, we're seeing similar themes here. <laughs> the Austrians coming down from the north, trying to defeat the French, strike to the heart of northern Italy, relieve their city. Once again, it would be beneficial to the Austrians if they could act quickly and decisively now. They've struggled to do that so far, or at the very least, Napoleon has beaten them in that respect. He has always been faster and more decisive. I mean, that's one of the characteristics of uh, Napoleon's style, right? He's decisive, he's fast. The Austrians, yeah, they could use a bit of that. <laughs> Napoleon, assuming any Austrian advance is still weeks away, has traveled to the Papal States oh. with a column of troops commanded by Colonel Lann. They intend to put a little pressure on the Pope who continues to stir opposition to France. Yeah, revolutionary France has, sort of unsurprisingly, <laughs> had a very bad relationship with the Catholic Church, a very bad relationship with the Pope, who has been indirectly, and to be honest, directly, uh, encouraging opposition to revolutionary France. Of course, the revolutionary French state has been very anti-Catholic, very anti-religious, so it makes sense that they have beef, uh, and this negative relationship will continue, I'll put it that way. <laughs> However, as soon as he receives reports of enemy movement, 
Napoleon races back to his headquarters at Rovabella. All right. By now, Alvinci's forces have also begun to advance, but serious planning failures quickly emerge. Lusignan's first column, on the right flank of the advance, has orders to cross the slopes of Monte Baldo and attack Joubert from the rear. It's soon clear that these orders are wildly optimistic, <laughs> dreamed up by staff officers who'd not seen the terrain. The peak of Monte Baldo is more than 7,000 feet high. Oh my goodness, the Austrians cannot get a grip. We also have this sort of typical division between strategy and tactics. You have your staff officers back home or wherever they are. And I feel like this is honestly more an issue of modern warfare. Um, and by modern, I mean as we get more modern, it becomes more of an issue who draw up these plans. But they're not necessarily looking at the situation on the ground. And then when you try to execute these plans, you say, wait a minute, <laughs> this strategy makes no sense. It doesn't conform with the situation that we're facing. And you run into issues like this. Its slopes are covered in deep snow and ice. The paths are treacherous, even more so after dark. And mm. there is no firewood for making camp. Only by taking a wide detour can Lusignan make any progress at all whilst losing 200 men to exhaustion and exposure. Yikes. Not ideal. <laughs> Meanwhile, the second and third Austrian columns reach the French outpost at Ferrara. An initial attack is repulsed. And following their orders, they wait for Lusignan's column to appear before launching a second attack. All right, Joubert is holding them off so far, but of course there's a lot more Austrian troops coming. However, Lusignan's column is not yet in sight. Alvinci's plan relies on swift, bold action. Yep. But just 48 hours in, it's falling apart. Not good. See, the skill of Napoleon, as we talked about, you can characterize his style as being swift and decisive, but Napoleon is able to follow through. Most of the time, no one's perfect, <laughs> but when he has a swift, decisive plan, he's able to put it into effect swiftly and decisively, right? This is the issue that the Austrians are having. Either they've been too cautious, too slow, or even when they've tried to be swift and decisive, they don't have the organizational capability in order to achieve that. I cannot think it was prudent to adopt a plan which, at this season, a fall of snow might render totally impractical. Huh, yeah, good point, Thomas Graham. <laughs> At Rovabella, Napoleon ponders the incoming reports. He knows that Joubert's forward outpost is under attack at Ferrara, that Massena has repulsed an Austrian attack on Verona, mm. and Augereau faces a sizable Austrian force near Legnago, poised to cross the Adige. Is Alvinci... Right, and I like that they're showing this from his perspective, right? They're showing us the units that Napoleon knows about, but not showing the full Austrian force, because at this very moment, Napoleon doesn't quite know. He has to imagine, right? He has to use the information he has to try and deduce, all right, which direction is the main Austrian force coming from? Using the same tactics as before, making his attack from the east. Then, a second report arrives from Joubert. Mm. His scouts have detected an enemy column marching around his flank. He has no doubt that he faces a major Austrian attack and has begun withdrawing his forces to Rivoli. The report I have given you is exact, he tells his chief. Be assured, hmm. the enemy will make every effort to throw me onto the blockade of Mantua. The enemy's plan has been unmasked, Napoleon announces, and issues a flurry of orders. There you go. Masse He's waiting to hear, trying to figure out where the Austrians coming from. Joubert gives him that clear answer. Now Napoleon knows what the situation is. He has to respond, and he has to respond quickly. Anna is to march immediately to reinforce Joubert. 
Augereau is to send him cavalry and guns, while the rest of his division keeps watch on Provera. Ray is to move up to Castelnuovo. Servurier is to be on high alert for an attempted breakout by the Mantua garrison. Such a typical Napoleon way of responding. Just the flurry of action. So many different units and commanders being sent in different directions. I mean, as we said, swift, decisive, able to handle many things at one time. This is Napoleon. While Joubert, the youngest and least experienced of Napoleon's divisional commanders, yep is instructed to hold Rivoli at any cost. Yep. <laughs> and assured that help is on the- That's quite a trial by fire. All right, Joubert, you have got an extremely important job all of a sudden. Don't fail. <laughs> away. A lot of quotes this episode. My friends, Bonaparte demands a last effort from you to annihilate the remains of the Austrian army who have dared to come again and measure themselves against the Republican Republicans. That's from Messena. You see Messena encouraging his division, basically framing it right there as a last effort. Come on, we need this last push to destroy the Austrians. After giving the Austrians a bloody nose at Ferrara, hmm. Joubert has extricated his troops overnight and taken up a defensive position around Rivoli. Napoleon arrives around midnight and immediately sets out with Joubert to inspect the enemy's positions. The weather had cleared and the moonlight was superb. Hmm. I climbed the different heights and observed the lines of enemy fires. They filled the country between the Adige and Lake Garda, and the atmosphere was ablaze with them. One could easily distinguish five camps, each composed of a column. Until reinforcements arrive, Napoleon has just Joubert's division. As you can see, this battle is basically going to be Alvinci's ability to send his men forward successfully against Joubert versus, well, one, Joubert's ability to defend, and two, Napoleon's ability to get his men, get reinforcements in quickly. You know, that is the situation we have here. Napoleon is currently outnumbered pretty badly, but he has many more troops on the way. Can he hold out long enough for those reinforcements to come into play? Or are the Austrians able to push hard enough to, you know, ruin his plan, defeat him before the reinforcements arrive? 10,000 men to hold off 24,000 Austrians. Ooh. Yeah. But Alvinci will help to even the odds oh. by ordering Lusignan's first column to attempt a wide outflanking march to cut off the French line of retreat and Napoleon mm. decides the main road to Rivoli, which passes through a steep defile known as the Pontari, can be held by a single regiment supported by entrenched cannon. Okay. This leaves more manageable odds. Yeah, you see Napoleon trying to even the odds. I'm sure you can make an argument that Alvinci should have just sent all of his troops forward in the same direction, or at least not try to perform this wide outflanking maneuver, especially when the French have more troops on the way. Like, I ain't no military strategist, I couldn't tell you that, but what we can see is that the numbers are starting to even out a little bit, or it at least looks, as they put it, more manageable than, you know, 24,000 versus 10,000, right? Of 9,000 against 12,000 in the center. But Napoleon wants to push out his defensive line to hold the slopes that mark the edge of the Rivoli Plateau. Mm. At 4 a.m., General Vial's Light Infantry Brigade advances through the darkness. All right. They drive back the Austrian outposts and take the San Marco Chapel. They're followed on their left by the rest of Joubert's division. But the French push too far Skirmishes break out along the line, with heavy fighting on the heights of San Marco. Napoleon had not wanted to start the battle so early, 
but the combat escalates. At dawn, the Austrians attack the plateau in force. Alrighty. <laughs> the French 85th Demi Brigade is outflanked and routed by Lipte's second column. Uh -oh. The 29th Light, on its right, is forced to retreat, and it looks like the French line is crumbling. Yeah, this is a pretty disastrous start to the battle. You know, I talked about this is the Austrians, how hard they can push versus how long the French can hold out. At this very moment, it appears that, well, that question has been answered. The battle started, the Austrians have almost immediately crushed the French lines, the French are falling back, the lines are crumbling, it's over, but, you know, of course, it's not actually over, we know Napoleon. But the 14th, on their right, fights tenaciously. It's an intense infantry battle across broken ground, vineyards and walled gardens, mm. with sudden charges, hurried withdrawals, and counter charges. But... When the Austrians overrun a French battery, an officer demands, 14th, will you let them take your guns? <laughs> His troops mount a ferocious charge that routs the Austrians and reclaims the battery. God, you can just imagine the chaos of the battle, right? And of course, you could say this about any battle of this era. But just imagine the sounds, the explosions all around you. You're going deaf. The smoke, you can barely see anything. You know, you are frantically continuing to reload your rifle, fire, reload. And then as the enemy gets in closer, you're dealing with melee combat. You're pushing forward with your bayonet, stabbing, retreating, rallying, turning back around. I mean, it is a crazy chaotic environment just imagine being there imagine having to fight in that environment it just takes so much bravery training organization discipline leadership it's truly remarkable by 9 a.m masena's troops have begun to arrive they take up position on joubert's left the buckled French line is stabilized. But so far, the French have only faced half of Alvinci's six columns. One by one, the others now join the action. Ready. <laughs> Vukasovic's sixth column is on the far side of the Adige River. But its guns cause havoc among French troops holding the Pontari. Under this covering fire, Royce's fifth column charges up the narrow road and in fierce fighting, storms the French entrenchments. Oh. <laughs> this advance threatens the entire French right wing with encirclement. Yeah, this is a dangerous spot for the French to be in. I mean, due to the nature of the battle, the French are sort of hanging on to the edge. They are clawing victory from the jaws of defeat constantly, right? Because they're waiting for more reinforcements to arrive. They're in such a risky position. It is right on the edge for them. And a retreat begins. Moments later, gunfire to the southwest reveals Lusignan's first column has reached Affy, poised to cut off their escape. Uh-oh. Uh, well, then, if you're the Austrians, you're saying, oh, well, maybe that wasn't such a bad idea. In fact, it was a great idea. We actually are going to cut off the French retreat. The French situation is desperate. They are outnumbered, surrounded, and under heavy attack. Yep. Napoleon's staff look anxiously to their commander. Hmm. One hey, when it's all going down, you look to the one guy who has made everything happen so far. Napoleon, he has been the one generating these victories. The situation is looking pretty dire. Everyone's going to turn to him. What does he do? Wondering what miracle can save the army now. All looks turned towards General Bonaparte. But after a short inspection, he limited himself to saying calmly, They're ours. <laughs> Sensing victory, 
General Alvinci and his staff ride forward to urge his infantry on. Napoleon remains calm. He knows Alvinci's centre columns are near exhaustion mm. and that they have no cavalry and little artillery support. He identifies Royce's column as the most immediate threat and orders Joubert to send every man and gun he can spare. God, and what a mark of leadership, right? Napoleon is in this extremely vulnerable, dangerous position. A lesser commander, and in fact, even a talented commander, might panic, pull back. Napoleon, in his wisdom, or perhaps in his hubris, says, mm, we have them. No need to worry about it. And he sees legitimate reasons why he need not worry. But of course, he does also have that confidence that inspires him to do whatever he thinks is best and not doubt his own decisions. He says, it might look bad, but trust me, they haven't got it. They're tired. They don't have the support. We can take this battlefield back. For a counterattack, General Leclerc and a 21-year-old Captain LaSalle then <laughs> charge with the entire French cavalry, just a few hundred horsemen. Under this onslaught, the lead Austrian troops are driven back into the gorge. Wow. Here, they collide with the rest of the column coming up. Cavalry and infantry jammed together, some pushing forward, others trying to escape. Right. Joubert's men pour fire down on them from the overlooking ridge. The final straw is the devastating explosion of an ammunition wagon. Whoa. Napoleon using the environment, the battlefield, to his advantage. And the explosion of an ammunition wagon, yeah, that would be devastating. Uh, first of all, that is sort of a disaster mid-battle. <laughs> you know, whoops, we needed that ammunition. But also, if you are, well, anywhere around that, you're going to see it. If you're an Austrian, you might start to panic. What was that massive explosion behind our lines? If you're even closer, imagine the carnage that explosion would cause. The explosion itself, the smoke, the shrapnel. I mean, what a disaster. You could see how that would uh, demoralize the men around it and would panic the Austrians in its vicinity. Austrian morale breaks. Right. The survivors flood back down the road to safety. Napoleon now turns his full attention to the center where the exhausted Austrian columns have become spread out and dis- It's remarkable. All the while, we can see the Austrians continue to push forward and the French continue to move back, right? And so, you know, from that simple fact, you might think, well, the Austrians keep pushing them, but Napoleon's just won this targeted victory. The Austrian line is spreading out. He says, eh, it's no problem. We've got them. Pull the troops back around. A focused assault take on the Austrians. Sorted. The sudden appearance of French cavalry, supported by infantry and guns, sparks panic and yep. a mass rout. There Alvinci, you go. Alvinci, who must have thought himself on the cusp of victory moments before, must join in an undignified race to the rear. Yeah. Spreading further alarm among his men. Hey, especially undignified for these Austrian commanders. You know, we know France of this era, you know, it's revolutionary. You have a bunch of young men who came from nothing filling these roles. Now, Napoleon did come from an aristocratic background, but a, you know, more modest sort of Corsican aristocratic background. Napoleon isn't afraid to get his hands dirty. A lot of these French officers, commanders even, are not afraid. Um, the Austrians, on the other hand, they still have a very different military culture, so... That would have been extremely undignified, uh, though, of course, necessary in this instance. <laughs> By 1 p.m., the bulk of the Austrian army is in headlong retreat, leaving Lusignan's first column in an awkward position. Uh-oh. Completely isolated, he begins a fighting withdrawal. Yeah. But the arrival of General Ray... Yeah, that's more than awkward. That is uh, verging on disastrous for him. ...his brigade in his rear triggers a rout. Fewer than half of his 4,000 men escape.
Through tenacity, courage and good fortune, the army of Italy has turned a grim situation into an astonishing triumph. Tenacity, courage, good fortune, absolutely the determination of the French soldiers. But also, this battle, as many battles are, this battle is a great example of the skill set of Napoleon. Look at how he was able to commit his men where they were needed and not panic when the situation seemed dire. He was able to focus his men swiftly, decisively, we use those words often, you know, win a victory on this side of the battlefield, swing his men around, and win the entire battle. Uh, truly a fantastic showcase of the brilliance of Napoleon. French casualties are modest. Austrian losses are devastating. Yeah. Ooh. 4,000 killed and wounded, 8,000 prisoners. Uh, makes sense from the sort of rapid French assault on this Austrian line that was spread out. An extreme number of Austrian prisoners taken. Those are absolutely devastating casualties, though think back on the number of casualties the Austrians were facing in Mantua just from the terrible conditions. And once again, that shows you how bad things are going uh, inside of Mantua. Over the next few days, 5,000 more Austrians are captured wow. as they struggle back through the mountain passes. Yeah, that's a disaster. Napoleon will not be there to see it. He's received news that Provera has crossed the Adige mm -hmm. and is marching on Mantua. It is a chance for him to strike one more blow against the enemy and to seal the fate of Mantua. Finally, let's do it. Can he achieve this? You are truly the spoiled child of victory. Yes, the spoiled child of victory. This is a very famous quote from Napoleon to Messina. I've certainly heard this several times before. Uh, when the French started popping up, I was like, oh, please translate it. <laughs> I don't want to read the French out. Yes, you are truly the spoiled child of victory. Pretty famous quote. Leaving Joubert in command at Rivoli, with orders to renew the attack at dawn, Napoleon races south with Massena's division. Hey, good job, Joubert, by the way. <laughs> Provera has no clue of the disaster that's engulfed Alvinci's army, nope. nor that the wolves now gather for him. Hmm. He pushes on to Mantua. Yeah. Unknowingly, you know, unaware of the disaster that has befallen the Austrians in the north, he continues to push towards Mantua. We're gonna relieve this city as Alvinci takes on Napoleon in the north. Yeah, that's not what is happening. <laughs> Shadowed by Augereau, who snaps up his rear guard. 2,000 men taken prisoner. With just 7,000 left, Provera's only hope is to break through the French siege lines. Yep. First, he tries to attack San Giorgio. Formidable French defenses and a powerful cannonade stop him cold. It all comes back to Mantua. You know, truly an important place, truly the key to this region of Italy, they've said it before, but it really does come back to this damn city. The next day, he launches a coordinated attack with Wormser against French forces at La Favorita. But Napoleon has now arrived with Massena's division from the north. Mm. Wormser's weak, starving men are forced back into the citadel, while a determined charge by the 57th Demi Brigade smashes into Provera's flank. Yep. With Augereau approaching. I mean, let's be honest, they didn't stand a chance. The Austrians have tried time and time again to relieve this city. Napoleon just dealt a decisive defeat against Alvinci. There's no shot that Provera is going to manage to relieve Mantua here. Approaching from the east, Provera faces impossible odds and surrenders 
with his entire force. Damn. Let's see those numbers. Oh, not good at all. <laughs> Vermsa's last hope of rescue has been crushed. Yeah. He puts off the inevitable for two agonizing weeks. Until, with all food exhausted, he finally accepts terms for Mantua's surrender there you on go. the 2nd of February. Finally. He and an escort will return to Austria. His 16,000 remaining troops become prisoners. Damn. Austrian losses in... Wow. Yeah, that's not a good deal. But, I mean, that's a deal made out of desperation, right? Wurmser left it until the very last second. Napoleon has beaten the Austrians time and time again. But that shows you the lack of negotiating power he had, the lack of leverage he had, having to leave the men behind. Yikes. In the campaign, reach a staggering 44,000 men. Oh, man. After eight months, the siege of Mantua is over. Finally. A victory that will soon be celebrated on the streets of Paris. Yep. But it is General Serrurier, not Napoleon, who takes the formal Austrian surrender. Hmm. His commander-in-chief has already departed to take on his <laughs> next opponent. Yeah, Napoleon's got other things to worry about. He doesn't have time to stick around. <laughs> he has other battles to fight. The Pope. Yeah, well, he's on to the Pope. And to be fair, Napoleon does have a flair for the dramatic, so it wouldn't be unlike him to stick around and make a propaganda scene <laughs> out of, you know, any sort of surrender or treaty signing. But, as they said, Napoleon's on to the damn Pope. Already has had a bad relationship with the French revolutionary governments. And like I said, it will continue to be bad, as we're going to see here. Uh, we will have everything that is beautiful in Italy, with the exception of a small number of objects in Turin and Naples. And here we see the French proclivity towards looting, <laughs> uh, especially under the revolutionary government. We see a lot of looting during the French Revolutionary Wars and then the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, a lot of people think of uh, the Iberian Peninsula in particular, the French commanders did a lot of looting out in Spain, but there was a ton of looting in Italy as well, which, I mean, makes sense. Think of all the priceless artifacts and art that can be found in Italy at this time. So, yeah, we see a lot of French looting during this entire conflict. From Rome, Pope Pius VI has once more been agitating against the French. Come on, Pius. And so Napoleon marches south with 9,000 men to, focus to explain on worldly the affairs. new realities of power in Italy. <laughs> Wait, can, can we replay that? I loved that. ...against the French. And so Napoleon marches south with 9,000 men to explain the new realities of power in Italy. <laughs> to explain the new realities of power in Italy. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. So, why is Napoleon marching south towards Rome? Well, you know, to explain the new reality that faces Pope Pius here. Yes, they're going to have a nice little chat, I'm sure. <laughs> At Faenza, General Victor's division sweeps aside papal forces. Yeah, they don't stand a chance. Come on now. And Ancona is taken without a fight. The subsequent Treaty of Tolentino forces the Pope to give up Romagna, as well as 30 million francs and a hundred works of art. Yep, we see a lot of Italian territory start to be taken by the French. Uh, the Austrians are next on the chopping block, frankly. Belatedly, Napoleon's victories persuade the Directory to back him in force. Yeah, very belatedly. We talked about earlier in this episode and throughout this series how you know, Napoleon basically came out of nowhere, right? I mean, you had the victory at Toulon. We had Napoleon protecting the French government from royalist protesters. You know, Napoleon had made a name for himself. You know, uh, people in the government were grateful to him. That's why he got this position. But no one expected too much of him, right? And accordingly, Italy, of course, it was an important theater of the war, but it was not seen as the most important theater of the war. 
the fighting along the Rhine was way more important. We have Jourdan, Moreau, and on the Austrian side, Archduke Charles. A rather formidable opponent, by the way, but... This was seen as by far the more important theater of the conflict, these French armies. And so, as we saw, the Directory just has not been giving Napoleon the support he's been requesting. I was going to say the support he needed, but, well, he clearly didn't need it. <laughs> he's succeeded immensely even without it, though support would have been fantastic. But Napoleon has crippled Austria. He has pushed them out of Italy at this point, and he can now go forth into their territory. He is in the process of crippling Austria, something that has not yet happened in this fighting along the Rhine River. And finally, the directory goes, oh, you know what? Maybe this is actually the most important theater of the war. Eh, send some support to Napoleon, see what he can get done. <laughs> French armies stuck on the Rhine are ordered to send him reinforcements. Yep. Their 34-year-old commander, another rising star of the French army, is congratulated on his brilliant winter crossing of the Alps. Oh. His name is General Jean Bernadotte. Ah. I know we've got some Bernadotte fans in the audience. Well, one big Bernadotte fan in particular, but he's an interesting fellow, huh? On the 10th of March, with 70,000 confident, seasoned troops under his command, wow. Napoleon goes on the offensive. Finally has the men he wanted. <laughs> he sends Joubert to invade the Tyrol, Massena to advance up the Piave Valley, while he leads the bulk of the army on the most direct... Do we see all these names, Joubert, Massena, those men who truly characterize Napoleon's early career. Now. Some Joubert will not make it too much further, to be honest. Messena will, though, you know, I mean, we watched Epic History TV's videos on Napoleon, the Napoleonic Wars. You know, Messena, his performance at times wasn't at its best. People have some issues with Messena, but he was a talented commander. And especially at this point, he's sort of, you know, earlier on, I think he's sort of at his peak. He does begin to decline years later, but we have a while to go, right? And so we just see some of these names, some of which will remain relevant, some of which will not, some of which will not make it much further, aka they will die. But these extremely talented and fascinating individuals who participated in Napoleon's success contributed to it. Red Road to Vienna. The enemy is scattered and demoralized. Even the appointment of a new commander, the Emperor's own brother, Archduke Charles, yeah. fails to restore morale. And Archduke Charles, an interesting fellow, brother of the Emperor, right? So when you think about, okay, how did Archduke Charles get such an important position? Well, he's got the familial tie, so he does get shot upwards faster than anybody else would be. But Archduke Charles is genuinely talented. Uh, he's more talented than... A lot of the other Austrian generals we've seen, some have been better than others, right? You know, Wurmser, he was a tough old guy. He did continue to hold out. He just couldn't keep up with Napoleon. Now, well, no one can really keep up with Napoleon. Archduke Charles couldn't, but he was a formidable opponent and uh, a rather talented commander during the Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. Charles is regarded as a military prodigy. Yeah. He's two years younger than Napoleon, and has defeated the armies of both General Jourdan and Moreau in Germany. Yeah, like they said, a very talented guy. Now, it's like when you measure anybody with Napoleon, Napoleon's going to come out on top. But don't let that take away from the accomplishments of Charles, a very young guy, someone who has made it to the top. Though, him making it to the top, of course, has to do with his talent, but has more to do with his familial ties. Napoleon, he's going to make it to the top, not through family ties, not in the slightest. You know, he really has to work his way up, though, you know, like we said, he is given this position in Italy because he's in good with the government, though that is something he had to work towards as well. Interesting fellow, similar in some ways, but from vastly different backgrounds and who will play vastly different roles in the future. But he does not have enough troops or time. No. 
He fights a delaying action at the Taliamento River. But it ends in disaster when Bernadotte surrounds and captures 2,000 Austrians, 10 guns, and eight standards. Mm. The French pursuit continues, with Massena covering Napoleon's northern flank. He arrives at Tarvis in time to block the Austrians' retreat. In three days' fighting, the French take another 3,000 prisoners. Damn. Napoleon's troops outmarch and outfight the Austrians at every turn. Yeah. But his. It, it really is that. The Austrians just cannot keep up. I mean, they literally can't keep up. Like, Napoleon is literally faster than them. But in terms of strategy, in terms of fighting, the Austrians can't keep up with the French. They just can't compete. Napoleon beats them in every respect. In terms of marching, fighting, strategy, he's just got them. The situation is more precarious than it seems. The other French armies are only just crossing the Rhine, while his own supply lines are now overextended and vulnerable. True. Rather than withdraw, Napoleon continues to advance while proposing... Yeah, I mean, Napoleon may be in a bit of a risky position, right? His supply lines are becoming overextended, but hey, when did Napoleon ever let that stop him? And sometimes that would cause a problem. Uh, that will cause big problems in the future. But here, he has the momentum and keeps moving forward. ...to Archduke Charles that they open peace negotiations. The Austrians accept. Yep. Two days later, both sides agree an armistice. And peace talks begin at Leoben. Yep. After five years of conflict, Napoleon's dazzling advance into Austria has brought the War of the First Coalition to an end. And the influence this one man has is remarkable, this general, right? Now, generals have always had a lot of autonomy. You sort of have to fill in that position. But as we've seen, the Directory has sort of tried to rein Napoleon in a bit. They don't want him to have too much independent authority. They're worried that he becomes a Julius Caesar, right? He gains a loyal following amongst his men. He has all this authority. And then he marches back on Paris and overthrows the government. Well, they had that exactly right. <laughs> That's what they're worried about. But even with these restrictions they have tried to put on him, with all of his success, it doesn't matter. He continues to gain authority, gain prestige, gain loyalty. And now... You know, Napoleon, he's made a lot of treaties. He's accepted surrenders, made treaties, you know, dictated the geopolitical situation in Europe. I mean, he has a massive amount of influence as just one man. So ends Napoleon's first campaign, almost exactly a year after it began. Wow. 380 miles away, on the shores of the Mediterranean. Hmm. Your countrymen will say, as they point you out, he belonged to the army of Italy. Very true. Negotiations at Leoben become the basis for the Treaty of Campo Formio, mm. signed five... Yeah, the Leoben... Uh, Leoben is more of a temporary stopgap, and from that we get the Treaty of Campo Formio. Five months later, the Austrian Netherlands, roughly modern Belgium, yeah. formally passed to France. The Venetian... Yeah, we have more French sister republics. <laughs> you know, nominally independent sister republics, a.k.a puppets of the French government. <laughs> Public, invaded and systematically looted by Napoleon's troops, is divided between France and Austria. Yeah, and we have the end of the Venetian Republic. Now, it's not like, you know, it was its own republic, but it was, of course, under the influence of surrounding powers before this. All of northern Italy was heavily under the influence of Austria, but now they just slice it up. It's done. 
so ends the 1200 year history of the Serene Republic of Venice. Mm -hmm. The famous horses of Saint Mark yep. are among its many treasures dispatched to the Louvre in Paris. Yeah, the horses of Saint Mark looted from the Venetians by the French. But to be fair, <laughs> they were originally in the Hippodrome in Constantinople. And they were looted in 1204 during the sack of Constantinople that happened during the Fourth Crusade. So, looted from one place, looted from another, who can really say who owns them, right? <laughs> I mean, they were originally taken from Constantinople, and now the French are taking them. To join its rapidly expanding Italian collection. Oh yeah, R very rapidly expanding. The French part of the French will have a wonderful collection of art and, uh, you know, famous pieces throughout history, right? And one of the arguments the French make, and this is sort of funny, you know, they see themselves as this most enlightened nation, right? They see themselves as having this justifiable cause. And, you know, it depends first off on who you talk to, how much this is actually genuinely believed. Sure, some people in the army or in the government might actually believe in this cause that they have. Especially at this point with the Directory, a lot of them are just saying that cynically. But they use this to justify all the looting. And it's sort of a funny argument like, well, you know, we are this sort of enlightened universal nation, and so we will take your artifacts and we will bring them back to Paris, and everyone can see them there. How nice, how enlightened, so universal of us. It's like, okay, you're just stealing stuff. <laughs> you're just going to Italy and stealing stuff. Now, you know, uh, a lot of these art and artifacts were in private collections before, so it's not like they were super accessible to the Republic, or sorry, to the public, right? If it's in some private chateau, if you're just an ordinary person, it's hard to see some of this art, but obviously people are not happy when you just steal stuff from them. You loot their famous art. And so, I don't know, I just think this French justification is a little bit funny. Venice joins its other Italian client states yep. to form a new Cisalpine Republic. The author of its constitution, Napoleon Bonaparte. There we go. And Napoleon becoming quite the constitution writer. Quite the writer of law. This is a trend that will continue. <laughs> It's an illustration of how far the 27-year-old general has come yeah. in just a year. Seriously, it really is. You know, Napoleon starts off, you know, he comes from this sort of modest Corsican aristocratic family. You know, he works his way up, goes to military school in France, and, you know, makes a bit of a name for himself, the Siege of Toulon, you know, protecting the government from these royalist protesters. He's making a bit of a name for himself, especially in political circles. But, once again, when he's placed in charge of the Army of Italy, he's so underestimated. And, to be fair, no one knows what he's capable of. He is just another political appointment. Ah, this guy probably doesn't know what he's doing. But in a very short amount of time, in this year, he proves everybody so wrong. He shows what he's made of. And the amount of growth that his career and his name has in this span is truly remarkable. He goes from someone who has a bit of a reputation, but hasn't really achieved too much, to someone who has achieved this fantastic, impressive campaign, has made a name for himself, has gained military power, political power. I mean... It's truly amazing. Having waged one of the most brilliant military campaigns in history, yeah. many would say his best, he now dictates terms to kings and popes. Summon I mean, it's a scrappy campaign, but it really is one of the best examples of the talents of Napoleon. ...new states into being and nurtures his status as the most celebrated military commander in Europe. Oh, yes. He has achieved all this thanks to formidable intelligence, relentless hard work, and inspiring leadership. Yeah. Which he has used to forge a unique bond of trust with his men. Oh, yeah. He's had luck, too, along the way. <laughs> well, you know, when we talk about these great men of history, as we might call them, 
it takes luck. You know, it takes great talent, determination, all that sort of stuff. It always takes a good amount of luck as well. <laughs> and been ably served by a group of brilliant officers, many of whom will be with him for yeah. years to come. Absolutely. That's a very fair thing to point out. You know, Napoleon is a brilliant leader. He's charismatic. He, you know, can achieve the loyalty of his men. He's skilled, but no one can do it alone. It takes, of course, the foot soldiers, but also a brilliant officer corps. And we see these men here, many of them, who will stick with him and perform admirably for years and years to come. We have some others, like Joubert, who, you know, uh, will die only a few years afterwards. But many of these men will stick with Napoleon and will perform great things in service of Napoleon. His career, his cause, whatever you want to call it. So he really has a group of impressive subordinates. For Napoleon still has many extraordinary things to achieve. Oh yes. His Italian campaign is just the first chapter in one of the most astonishing lives in history. Fair. <laughs> Did you know the Epic History TV merch store has right. a range of Napoleonic... Brilliant. And you guys should check out this video from Epic History TV, please. It's linked down below. Leave them a like, subscribe, check out their merch store, especially since it's a new video. Show them support for making these fantastic videos. I, I truly think they make some of, or honestly, the best historical content on YouTube. I mean, I have a couple of favorites, but the amount of quality, the production quality, the storytelling that they include in their videos, I think is really unparalleled. I mean, it's truly amazing to me. I love their videos. Every new release from Epic History TV is basically an event, right? As it should be. Now, we're done with their series on Napoleon's first campaign. I know they have more Napoleonic stuff to come. I see the polls they put up asking, you know, which other topics do you want us to cover? They've covered a good chunk of Napoleon's career at this point, his first campaign, a good chunk of the Napoleonic Wars, but there's a lot more to cover, Egypt in particular. There's a lot of other topics, and so I'm always excited to see whatever they have in store for us, whether it is more Napoleon, which I love, or other topics. I think they do a fantastic job with other topics as well. Anyway, this was a fantastic series. I love that we got this opportunity to talk about Napoleon in Italy. We're filling out our Napoleonic catalog over time. You know, we started out with the Epic History TV videos on some of these more famous battles of the Napoleonic Wars, especially later on. Then, you know, we did that extra history series on Napoleon in Egypt that, you know, it had some flaws. <laughs> a lot of you had a lot of issues with it, which I agree. I think some of the framing and facts were a bit off, but we have covered Napoleon in Egypt to a certain extent. Now we've covered Napoleon's first campaign. There's a lot more to cover, and I'm excited to do it. Anyway, fantastic series. Go and check out this video. Uh, if you enjoyed the reaction, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon. It's linked down below. All that good stuff. Now, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.